Now, Kathleen Sherry, someone was either really angry or really sick. Trees planted where the family moved in years ago are chopped down in one fell swoop. TV 2 Scott Lewis investigates. A West Bloomfield teen pleads guilty to a lesser charge in a fight that left his classmate in a coma. I'm Lauren Bishop, and I'll have the story coming up. Some of the city's top columnists may be creating dissension among the ranks of striking journalists at the News and the Free Press. I'm Mike Redford, and I'll tell you what their union has to say about it. And the religious right. What is their real agenda in government? I'll tell you in my special report. These stories and much more this Monday, July 24th, 1995. Now, your most experienced news team, TV2 Eyewitness News at 5. Good evening, I'm Jill Perkins, in for Jerry Hoda. And I'm Rich Fisher, and as always, thanks so much for being with us. Well, a family living in an old farmhouse in the rolling hills of northern Oakland County is coping today with crime in the county. It happened in Springfield Township, seen by many as a place with fresh air, good neighbors, and plenty of open space. Over the weekend, the family's property was the target of a senseless attack of vandalism, one that destroyed more than 100 trees. TV2 investigator Scott Lewis has the story, and it's new for Eyewitness News at 5. Dan and Maureen Moltrup have spent years restoring this 1833 farmhouse. They've added a lot of trees to the barren landscape, most planted from seedlings. That's why they were devastated Sunday morning when they woke up to this. More than 100 trees were cut down during the night by vandals. The pit in my stomach and in my heart, I'm just sick, just devastated over this because there's no reason for this whatsoever. Shame on them. 96 Austrian pines, 15 birch, 9 maples, and 1 ash, all lost in what the family calls random mayhem. Most of the trees are saplings, hacked off cleanly, probably with a machete or a tree trimmer. I don't know who drives around with those kind of things in the back of their vehicle, but uh, the, it did the job, 121 trees. The Moltrups can't prove anything, but they think the insanity might have been fueled by alcohol. There was a big party going on in this park just down the road in the hours before the vandalism. A lot of young people, a lot of drinking, and it got rowdy. Police found a couple of beer cans on the ground near the toppled trees. They're the same brand left behind after that party in the park. Moltrup says crime is creeping into their rural neighborhood. There's been a rash of vandalism, including $50,000 damage to the new school across the street last year. She says they need better police protection. We have no surveillance. We have a one officer who does our whole township. It's, it's not safe. And, and looking around, you think it would be. But in the country, neighbors still take care of neighbors. Don Stein of Bordine's Nursery delivered these two new saplings donated by a local businessman. You know, this is a community Excellent. outrage. And we will, we will help you more with them, definitely. Oh, gosh, no thank problem. you so much. The young trees had been lost three times before to drought, a harsh winter, and a farmer cutting hay. Each time they were replanted. But Maureen says she's just too devastated by this senseless destruction to start all over again. In Springfield Township, Scott Lewis, TV2 Eyewitness News. Well, police say they have no suspects in the case so far, but they are investigating that party held at the nearby park, and they are checking the beer cans for fingerprints. We have a breaking story to bring you at this hour. In Harrison Township, Macomb County Sheriff's deputies say that they are investigating a homicide near Union Lake Road and Metro Parkway. Details are sketchy right now, but TV2 has a crew on its way to the scene, and we will bring you the very latest as soon as more information becomes available. For the last year and a half, a West Bloomfield High School student has been in a coma because of one well-placed punch. Now one of his classmates is taking responsibility by pleading guilty. As you'll see in this follow-up, TV2's Lauren Bishop reports it was a good move for Desmond Venn. He could have served 10 years in prison, but for now he faces only one. Desmond Venn's attorney says the teen was always willing to take some responsibility for the punch that left his West Bloomfield High School classmate Stephen Pata in a coma. But the question was how much responsibility. Today he pled guilty to aggravated assault. He felt some degree of responsibility for what happened. The reason that he did not plead guilty earlier was because he was grossly overcharged. And the reason that this case took on such a profile was because of the overcharge. 
Venn admits he slugged Stephen Pata during a brawl outside the high school in May of 94. Pata's brainstem was severed when his head hit the pavement. For the last year and a half, he's been comatose and needs 24-hour care. Venn had originally been charged with felony assault. He was charged with a 10-year felony, which was under no stretch of the imagination. Um, uh, should have been the appropriate charge. And a judge agreed, saying the original charge was excessive. He threw it out in favor of aggravated assault, the one-year misdemeanor to which Venn pled guilty, a plea that angers Pata's attorney. What is happening to him? Virtually nothing. He, he's able to walk. He's able to go on with his life. Can't say the same thing about Steve Pata. Steve Pata can't go on with his life. Prosecutors fought for over a year to get the tougher charge reinstated. They took the case all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court. But at every level, the judges refused to hear it. There was such a disparity between the, the injury and the, uh, the penalty that we wanted just to make sure that the courts all affirm that, yes, that's what the law is, and that's exactly what happened. But the plea doesn't end the case. Stephen Pata's family is suing then, in part for the medical bills their attorney says have time $600,000. In West Bloomfield, Lauren Bishop, TV2 Eyewitness News. Now, Ben's sentencing will come within the next month. The teen's attorney says he will ask for probation. An Ypsilanti Township woman was attacked in her own home today, and it all began with a knock on the door. Police say the victim woke up around 4.30 this morning to answer her door. Just as she opened it, a man pushed his way inside, punched her in the face, and then raped her. Police in Washtenaw County are holding a 30-year-old Ohio man for questioning. Rich? In South Carolina, a judge will not grant a mistrial in the case against Susan Smith. On Saturday, she was found guilty of murder for drowning her two sons. Smith is now going through a sentencing hearing where she could end up getting the death penalty. But before that hearing, Smith's attorney asked for a mistrial. That's because one of the jurors ran into the grandmother of Smith's ex-husband. She happened to be in the hotel where the jurors were sequestered. The judge says a mistrial is unnecessary since the contact between the two was brief and the juror reported it immediately. And in the O.J. Simpson trial, a scientist is offering evidence to back up claims of a police frame-up. In testimony you saw first here on TV2, the expert says some of the blood evidence contains a preservative. Toxicologist Frederick Riders says he detected a chemical called EDTA in two blood stains. One of those stains came from a sock found in Simpson's bedroom. The blood is believed to have come from Nicole Simpson. The other stain was on a gate behind Nicole Simpson's condominium and may have come from O.J. Simpson. Do you have an opinion on whether, based on those chromatograms, there is EDTA present in the stain from the back gate? In my opinion, yes. It demonstrates that there is EDTA present in that stain. Common practice when well, police use EDTA to preserve blood used in investigations. Simpson's attorneys say police investigators planted blood taken from OJ and Nicole Simpson on key pieces of evidence. And of course, when testimony resumes tomorrow, you can count on us for live coverage of the Simpson trial. It begins uh, every noon on uh, TV2. And then join us for Eyewitness News Prime Time at 10. We, of course, will have a wrap up of uh, the very latest testimony. You'll now, some of the choice best known and highest paid newspaper writers are getting ready to pressure their own union to head back to the bargaining table. The columnists are collecting signatures on a letter to the executive director of their union. Now, that move comes on the 11th day of the newspaper strike and one day after the management of the free press warned that hundreds of strikers could lose their jobs if the walkout does not ensue. TV 2's Mike Redford begins our team coverage with this report from downtown Detroit. This letter from the Free Press publisher and editor says, in effect, striking news personnel would be fired if the strike isn't settled soon. It was sent to 300 members of the newspaper guild at the Free Press. Many are reporters who are hurt by the letter. This letter sort of is an insult, and in that regard, it's an insult to the intelligence of all of the workers at the, at the Free Press and News because they know it's a bunch of hogwash. The letter also says that the newspaper guild refuses to go back to the bargaining table. Some say that's aimed at creating dissension in the union ranks. Everybody wants to go back to the table. The Teamsters want to go back. All six unions want to go back. Nobody wants to be on strike. And the only question is when to go back. TV2 has learned that some of the city's top columnists are circulating a petition demanding that its union leadership go back to the bargaining table immediately. Union leadership tells TV2 that those columnists know very little about the labor dispute and certainly aren't walking the picket line. 
they've called me, uh, Bob Talbert being one of them. Bob Roos, a free press staffer for seven years, is spearheading the petition drive, but says a host of big-name columnists are endorsing it. And Roos feels that the newspaper guild is too closely aligning itself with the five other unions in the strike and not effectively representing its membership. I'm anti-stupidity, and I think this is really reaching a, a low that it shouldn't reach. Somebody needs to, uh, to start the initiative and get back and start talking. The paper wants to talk. Let our union go back and talk, and maybe the other unions can follow. Bruce says he is not anti-union. He just wants his job back. The petition, with more than 100 names on it, will be hand-delivered to the Newspaper Guild offices later this week. In Detroit, Mike Redford, TV2 Eyewitness News. Meanwhile, Free Press publisher Neil Shine is listed in good condition tonight at Cottage Hospital in Gross Point Farms. He was admitted to the hospital yesterday morning complaining of stomach pains. Two years ago, Neil Shine was treated for Hodgkin's disease, but he returned to work and his cancer has been in remission. Even the strikers on the line are wishing Neil Shine the very best of health tonight. Now, the owner of the Mako Body Shop in Roseville says business is better but not what it should be. A striking newspaper workers are picketing outside the woman's shop, but they say they support her business. They're just getting as close as they can to newspaper offices. TV News' Amy Jacobson is at that shop, along with picketing Teamsters, and she picks up our team coverage of the newspaper strike as she joins us with this uh, live report. Amy? Well, Rich, series, Sherry Zora was literally caught in the crossfire. Normally, she rakes in $15,000 a week, but during the first week of the Detroit newspaper strike, she grossed only $2,400. Of course, she blames these strikers for the financial blow, but the two sides are trying to work together. For instance, she says through our media reports and signs of supports like this one from the strikers, she hopes business will come back. As soon as the pickets went up, business here at this Roseville Mako went down. Owner Sherry Zora says her company lost $13,000 week one of the strike. She says some customers thought Mako was on strike, while others feared crossing the picket line. Business is not back to what it was before. I mean, the news coverage has helped a great deal, but no, we are not back to where. There's a lot of customers that have come in that have said they're still very intimidated by crossing the line, and we're very careful about warning customers when they call that there are picketers out front. It's not because of us, but because of the building behind us. We really felt bad, especially the first weekend. Um, um, they really got caught in the crossfire. Uh, so we've, we've tried to do a few things. Curtis says they tried to move the picket line back in front of the newspaper distribution center, but were refused. To smooth things over, they've made hand-painted signs of support for the Zoras, but realized they have nowhere else to voice their concerns. They're a hard-working uh, business people here. We don't want to mess up their business. Uh, we have to stick up for your right. But we have to. We have to stick up, and we have to. We have to pick it. And with no end in sight for the strikers, Zora has also erected this sign on her building, trying to separate herself and her business from these strikers, which mark, excuse me, march on the outskirts of her property. Reporting live from Roseville, Amy Jacobson, TV2 Eyewitness News. All right, Amy. Uh, by the way, we uh, like to remind you that we are committed to keeping you covered during this newspaper strike. Coming up a little later, we'll take a look at stocks of local interest. We even have obituaries. And then at uh, right about 5.35, a Detroit Free Press Names and Faces columnist Neil Rubin has the latest Hollywood buzz on Don Johnson and the troubles for his new television show. Then in the Eyewitness News Report at 6 with Huell, Free Press political columnist Hugh McDermott will tell you how much it'll cost you to hobnob with Governor John Engler tomorrow. And then as always, TV2 commentator, Free Press columnist Mitch Album will join us for a report on Eyewitness News at 10, our primetime report. Now coming up here at 5, some call it the computer disease. Others know it as carpal tunnel syndrome, a painful ailment that can destroy a career. Well, now there is relief for some without surgery. It's all next on TV2. And their message is hard-hitting, conservative, and filled with plenty of religion. But do the views of the religious right translate into good government? I'll examine that issue in my special report that's coming up at exactly 5.19. Oh, we've got some flooding downpours, thunder and lightning in some parts of town and in other areas, it's kind of sunny. I'm Chris Edwards. I'll let you know what's where and for how long in just a few minutes. Kind of tough weather for golfers, Mark. Oh, yeah, Chris, but the Tigers come back home after a road trip worse than Animal House and play a little golf for Sparky's favorite charity. But this Tiger team is in a huge sand trap. Sports coming up at the big board in about 31 minutes. Hey, Spark, can I play through? 
who can't read all about it, watch it. TV2's got who and what you want. Eyewitness Morning. Eyewitness News at noon. First News at 4 o'clock. Eyewitness News at 5. The Eyewitness News Report at 6. And Eyewitness News Primetime at 10 o'clock. Plus, see your favorite newspaper columnists when they join TV2 Eyewitness News, where the facts tell the story. Tonight. Then posed for Playboy in the you-know-what. Ron and Nancy Reagan's rebel daughter Patty Davis tells her side on Bonds Tonight. Watch Bonds Tonight, 11 p.m. tonight. Huel Perkins gives you national news with your perspective on the Eyewitness News Report. Surgery is the usual prescription for carpal tunnel syndrome, one of the most common nerve problems caused by repetitive tasks at work or even at home. But TV2 health reporter Kay Lowry explains that doctors are now finding that surgery may not be the best medicine for everyone. Vicki Joseph counts tires for a living. That's the easy part of her job. The hard part, until a few months ago, was at her computer. An awkwardly arranged workstation was proving to be a major pain. It caused muscle imbalance and compressed nerves all down my arms. Um, and I was getting headaches, you know, the whole entire sequence. Joseph suspected she had the so-called computer disease, carpal tunnel syndrome. I was in so much pain, I thought surgery was the only outlet. Her employers estimated surgery, rehabilitation, and lost wages would add up to about $30,000. But Vicki Joseph is back on the road to full recovery at a fraction of that cost and without surgery. The difference is Dr. Susan McKinnon's alternative conservative approach. Patients that come in with upper extremity complaints often have a lot more going on than just a little bit of nerve compression at the wrist. McKinnon used to prescribe surgery to relieve pressure on the nerve. If you have a carpal tunnel release, for instance, and you think it's going to cure every ache and pain in your upper extremity, um, then you're, you're going to be disappointed. McKinnon and a small but growing number of other doctors now prescribe physical therapy and exercise along with changes in work and home environments. Kay Lowry, TV2 Eyewitness News. Now, for those of you who spend a lot of time in front of your computer, Dr. McKinnon urges good posture, sit up straight, regular stretching exercises to limber up, and that could be your best way to avoid carpal tunnel problems before they occur. I think golf is a good way to avoid it, too. <laughs> Tennis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Relaxation. <laughs> let's, try, let's try a little more of that. Okay. There you go. Well, they have a powerful message that is driving voters to the ballot box and shake, shaking up America's government. Politics and the religious right, subject of my special report coming up next on Eyewitness News. And Don Johnson is all set to return to television this fall, but now big problems are slowing production of his new series. Detroit Free Press Names and Faces columnist Neil Rubin has the lowdown. That's all coming up at 535 right here on TV2. Stay with us. It's coming together on these issues based on the values, not necessarily denomination. Their issues are all right here in their contract with the American family. Shrink government, tax relief, replace welfare, bolster education, restrict abortion, and balance the budget. A vast majority of all Americans, whether they consider themselves to be part of the religious right or not, look at the agenda that Ralph Reed has and, and agrees with that agenda. Elements of the Jewish community also agree with the Christian coalition. If people really take the time to read this document, I think most people would agree with it, of all religions and all faiths. The, particularly the breakup of the family and the deterioration of moral values in the youth, that concerns us greatly. A 1994 poll conducted for the Los Angeles Times shows 53% of Americans feel our moral problems are more pressing than economic ones. And 80% consider declining morality a serious problem. But still, opposition exists. The facts are real clear. that There has been a real change in America in the last 30 years. And in politics, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. The Christian Coalition has chapters in all 50 states. The Michigan chapter is barely a year old and already 
has 55,000 dues-paying members. Now tonight, on Eyewitness News Prime Time at 10, I'll examine what opponents say is a trampling of the Constitution by religious conservatives. Mm -hmm. Big issue in the upcoming presidential mm -hmm. campaign. Is indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, is there a big change ahead for Detroit's weather? TV2 meteorologist Chris Edwards will have the answer when he joins us for the forecast next. And tragedy on the highway for a traveling church group as a bus takes a deadly plunge. We'll have that story coming up right after weather. This is TV2 Eyewitness News, serving Novi, Gross Point Woods, and the rest of southeastern Michigan. Stay with us. It had been a Weather brought to you by your southeast Michigan Chrysler Plymouth dealers. Now, your first look at the area's most accurate weather forecast. Well, it's that old familiar summer pattern. Blue skies in the morning, rain in the afternoon. And you know, we better get used to it. It looks like it's going to last for several days. It's tough to get used to this when it's sunny one minute and a downpour the next. That's what's been going on. Let's take a look outside right now, or at least a look at the conditions outside. Partly sunny, 77 at Metro Airport. Temperature actually up a couple of degrees. 7 seems to be our lucky number. We have a southeast wind at 7 and 74% humidity. It is humid out there. Meantime, barometer has been steady for most of the day. It's falling slowly right now, and the high today was 83, again, with the humidity and the scattered storms. Now, mainly right now at this moment, I'm watching Washtenaw County. This area of thunderstorms has been putting out some heavy rain, and it's really not been moving much. There's just been a very slight drift to the south with these storms. So, Saline southward in southern Washtenaw County been getting an inch and a half to two inches of rain. That's some flooding rainfall. Other thunderstorms generally aren't as heavy, and they're a little more scattered out. Northwestern Oakland County, some to the east of Flint as well. Most of the Tri-County area in pretty good shape. But again, these storms moving toward Romulus right now, and they have a big effect on temperatures as well as bringing those localized flooding rains. In the 70s, where it's rained, or it's uh, raining at this moment, 81 in Pontiac. Look at that. Toledo has not seen rain. They're almost 90 degrees. And sun and clouds mixed in Lansing right now, it's 82. Here's a wider view of how the rain has been moving the last few hours. The scattered showers and thunderstorms southeast part of the state. Also here in northern Ohio, all the way back to Chicago. But the biggest cluster is west of town now and gradually working to the east and southeast. So you may get a good dousing downpour during the evening hours. Here is the satellite picture of the last 24 hours. And we're looking for those bright white flare-ups of clouds. And they are showing up in the southeast to the south of us and of course right over top of us here in lower Michigan. If we could get a cold front just sweep through here, we would put an end to the humidity and the risk of showers and storms. And actually there is a cold front after tonight's showers go away. We're watching this front to the north of us in the UP tomorrow morning, but it moves closer to us, but it looks like it's going to put on the brakes before it gets through. So tomorrow afternoon again, scattered showers and thunderstorms most likely late in the day. And it looks like we have the same threat on Wednesday because this front doesn't go through. It just kind of stalls. It's found a home splitting Michigan in two. 80s for highs tomorrow. I think upper range of the 80s, which is well above normal for this time of year. And again, the humidity makes it feel a little hotter. By 11 o'clock, most of the showers and storms should be over. I think it'll be the next few hours that we have the best chance. 73 at that hour. 8 in the morning, hazy sun and 72. And at noon tomorrow, we'll be into the low 80s. The chance of storms increases greatly after the noon hour. Here's our forecast in detail for tonight. Scattered thunderstorms, some with heavy rain, lightning and thunder this evening. Then they go away, low 70 on a light southwest wind. Tomorrow, 88 the high with scattered afternoon thunderstorms and a southwest wind. Now, the forecast for Wednesday looks about the same. We'll call it 86 with some sunshine and mainly late day storms. Should get a break for Thursday, but basically all the way into the first part of the weekend. Temperatures heating up again, mid to upper 80s. Scattered thunderstorms late in the day. You know, in the tropics, they deal with this for about 10 yeah. months out of the year. We deal with it for a few weeks. Well, we can take a few weeks. Well, boy, you're right. Some of them are coming down. Mm -hmm. We've, We've really had one here. Down. We sure yeah. have. Exactly. All right, thanks. We have an update now on a breaking story we told you about a little earlier in this newscast, a homicide in Harrison Township. TV2 investigator Scott Lewis joining us now live from the scene. Scott, what have you been able to find out? Well, Rich, I'm at the corner of Union Lake and Ballard in Harrison Township, just a stone's throw from Metro Parkway and I-94. And the owners of this house right over here, Grace and George McCloskey, are going to be in for a real shocker when they return tonight from a three-week vacation in Florida. It turns out there is apparently, I'm sorry, a, a vacation in Europe. It turns out that there has apparently been a murder in their backyard. Now, the Macomb County Sheriff's Department got an anonymous 911 call around 1 o'clock this afternoon. The caller told them that they should check on someone who is at this address. When officers arrived here, they found a body lying in the yard in the northwest corner of the lot. 
Apparently, um, the McCloskey son, who's about 35 years old, had some friends over last night. We don't know if it was a party, but it ended in murder. We talked with Jerry McCluskey, another son, who was not at the gathering last night. Body's been there since 2 o'clock this morning, from what I hear. Looked like he was murdered? It, it looks like he was murdered, yeah. Shot? Either shot or stabbed. There's a, a wound in the middle of his back. Have you been able to talk to your brother to see what happened? He knows, knows nothing. He has no idea what, uh, he's not saying nothing. Now, police confirm that the people at the house are not giving up much information right now about what happened here. There are more officers on the way to uh, take a closer look at this crime scene. At this point, uh, we don't know too much about the victim. We know that he is a young white male. Uh, he's not a family member, not a, a McCluskey family member. Uh, police are not going to release any more information on him at this point. They're uh, continuing to go over the crime scene. We should have more information later. Reporting live from Harrison Township, Scott Lewis, TV2 Eyewitness News. All right, Scott, thank you very much. And, of course, uh, Scott will uh, continue to uh, gather information on that uh, breaking story. And we'll have a complete report for you, of course, tonight on Eyewitness News primetime at 10 o'clock. A church trip turns tragic for one group. That story tops today's CNN report. A bus carrying churchgoers crashed through a guardrail and dropped down an embankment in New York. That accident killed one person, injured 30 others. Investigators say that the brakes on the bus failed. An undercover federal agent testified at the Waco hearings today that his bosses knew that David Koresh expected their raid. The ATF agent was inside the Waco compound before the raid. He told the congressional hearing that his superiors knew Koresh had been tipped off. And the agent says that his bosses lied to the public when they denied knowing Koresh was warned. David Koresh and 80 of his followers died in that fire at the Waco compound after federal agents kept the place under siege for 51 days. Well, on a hot, muggy day like today, it's a good idea to think cool. And people in Farmington Hills are doing just that. They're only about six weeks away from opening a brand new ice arena. And that story tops today's edition of the Suburban News Network. The new $6 million rink is set to open its door September 1st. The arena is located at Founders Sports Park on 8 Mile Road. A staff of professional instructors will offer ice skating classes for children, teens, and adults. The arena will also be home to a new youth hockey team. The schedule of ice times will be available early next month. In Oakland Township, a proposal to build the community's first fire station is stirring up a lot of controversy. Some neighbors are upset over plans to put the fire station directly behind the township hall on Collins Road. They're concerned about fire trucks speeding through neighborhoods on the way to a call. Instead, they like to see it built on the edge of the community. A public hearing on the issue takes place tomorrow night. The township now contracts with the city of Rochester and Orion Township for firefighting. And in Southfield, the city is helping to spruce up neighborhoods by selling trees. People who live in Southfield or who own businesses there can buy shade trees, flowering trees, and evergreens at a reduced rate. A business can get a tree planted on city property between a sidewalk and curb for $130. Southfield will also deliver trees to private property for $100. And if you live in Southfield, you're interested in a discount dogwood deal or buying a bargain birch, contact the Southfield Forestry Division. Now, coming up, the king of pop is looking for a new world to conquer, so he's heading into cyberspace. Yeah, find out how Michael Jackson is using uh, megabytes and dabs of data to reach his fans. Detroit Free Press names and faces countless. Neil Rubin has the latest on Jackson and much more celebrity news coming up next. And we are working on these stories. New for the Eyewitness News Report at 6. A breakdown on the ground could leave thousands of travelers up in the air tonight. Coming up at 6 tonight, we will show you why a computer problem is causing concern in the skies. And we'll tell you if you have any reason to be concerned. Also new for 6, a presidential honor for a man who was a century ahead of his time. You'll hear his story of courage. And we'll show you the Michigan connection. Plus, Detroit Free Press columnist Hugh McDermott looks at the high price of politics and who's paying it. Those stories and much more tonight on The Report at 6 o'clock. Now let's go to Mark Wilson for the latest in sports. Marky. Huel, uh, with the NBA lockout in full force, the kids got to play some hoop with Allen Houston today. Come on with us as we go to camp. It's at the big board in a couple of minutes. Bring your shorts and shoes. Hey, Allen, I'm open. Over here. Hey, 
excitement, you bitch. It's easy as sugar pie, honey bunch. You know that we love you. Say yes to Michigan. Well, what's the buzz in Hollywood? During the uh, newspaper strike, a very familiar face from the Detroit Free Press will keep you in touch with celebrity happenings, and there is that familiar face. Names and Faces columnist Neil Rubin here to, uh, hi, you're not really dishing out the dirt, you're oh. just giving us the information that we all want to know. That's right, I'm just a humble reporter who happens to chronicle dumb stuff famous people do. <laughs> and get paid for it, too, but, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, rega I've regained my amateur status. <laughs> Don Johnson's new cop show on CBS won't be ready as promised for fall. In fact, it probably won't even be ready at mid-season. About the time the network was ready to pencil off-duty into the schedule, it noticed that Johnson has no pilot, no cast, and no script. Johnson has been having some personal problems, which is a polite way of saying his wife is living with Antonio Banderas. CBS was trying to cut him some slack, but it ran out of patience when he turned in a short promotional tape that basically consisted of Don Johnson babbling about the many benefits of having a transvestite in the cast. For those who've lost track of Johnson since the glory days of Miami Vice, he's devoted himself to forgettable movies like, uh, well, I'm sure there were a few of them. Two other quick casting notes. Mandy Patinkin will be leaving Chicago Hope after eight episodes to spend more time with his family. He says thanks for helping him sell all those records. He'll see you again when the kids are grown. He'll be replaced by Oakland County native Christine Lottie, who describes her character as an irreverent brat. Michael Jackson will sit down for a little online chat with his fans next month. Through the wonders of technology, he'll be able to dodge the hard questions simultaneously on all three major online services. You can let your fingers do the moonwalking August 17th at 10 p.m. Elsewhere in the King of Pop's unique little world, a lawsuit filed by five of his former security guards has been dismissed. Jackson's lawyer pointed out that even though the guards had signed confidentiality agreements, they practically tripped over each other on their way to do tabloid TV shows. Carly Simon and her ex-husband, James Taylor, will perform together for the first time in 16 years, August 30th in Martha's Vineyard. They agreed to do it because it's for charity and because he still hasn't returned her Boss Gags albums. A TV cameraman in San Juan, Puerto Rico, has sued Sylvester Stallone for kidnapping, assault, and harassment. Cesar Santos said Stallone and his bodyguards threatened him and made him give up his videotape. And he suffered, oh, about $550,000 worth of pain and trauma. Santos says he was just doing his job on the set of a movie called Assassins when Stallone began insulting him and a guard offered to bust his face. Stallone says Santos was never touched or harmed, and by way of extending the olive branch, he calls Santos a dirtbag trying to extort money. Santos did get his videotape back eventually, and the movie publicist who handed it over had the nerve to ask the station not to make Stallone look bad. Of course, if they wanted to do that, all they'd have to do is show Rhinestone. Oh, 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 that's not the one. Was he in that with uh, Dolly Parton? Dolly Parton. They took a perfectly nice little screenplay uh -huh. and rewrote it on the fly and yes. came up with Ishtar in Nashville. <laughs> oh, Lord. More Wednesday? More Wednesday. OK, we'll look forward to it. Me too. Thanks, Neil. You bet. Fuel? Thanks, guys. Well, during the newspaper strike, TV2 has you covered with all the latest news and all the features that you usually read in the newspaper. And here are today's obituaries. Now it's your turn to stand up and tell Detroit that you've gone to two. Tell us why, who, what, where you've gone to two. And you could be in a TV2 promo just like this one. Send us a postcard to Gone to Two, Box 2000, Southfield, Michigan 48037. And you could be on TV2. Remember, now it's your turn, Detroit. Stand up and tell them that you Tigers needed to get home, I think. They had a kind of a disastrous road trip. David Wells, uh, the only one who really, uh, well, he's been the stopper all year for him. But they are back, uh, the big catch tournament today. Yep. Sparky's yes. uh, charity. And you know what they say, Rich? You can go to the Wells once too often. Oh, oh yeah. You, oh. No, they don't say it. You do. I do say it. That's true. <laughs> the Tigers don't need an off day. They need an off season. The way things are going, maybe a little golf will do them good. On the heels of their miserable trip out west, the team returned home, and many took part in Sparky Anderson's annual golf outing for his favorite charity, Catch for Kids. He's got a nice swing, doesn't he? It's all right.
took place in Bloomfield Hills today. Al Kaline, Stevie Eiserman, Larry Sorensen, Alan Trammell, and a host of others all helping out the skip. Big topic, though, is this Tigers losing skid. 10 of 11 and fading fast in the AL East. It's of much concern to this guy right here, Alan Trammell. Certainly we never like losing, but uh, I know that one thing that uh, you have to prepare the same way whether or not you win or lose, and uh, that's what we're trying to teach these kids. We played the last 11 games, seven of them against California. California, if they're not the best club, it's an argument between them and Cleveland. Uh, if they're not the best club, they're the second best club. All right, Sparky, you now the Tigers will try and turn the tables on the West. The A's come to town tomorrow for a three-spot Tony La Russa and company. Dave Stewart will not be with him. If you missed it yesterday, Stu, the longtime pitcher, retired and had one of the more emotional goodbyes you'll ever see. And I'd like to say thank you. And it's been really beautiful. And I appreciate your patience, the writers. And, uh... I'll be happy. Thank you. Good gentleman of the game. He's had some problems, but Dave Stewart retired. All right, here are your baseball standings in the AL East. The Tigers now in fourth. Behind the Bo Sox, O's, and Yanks, that's fourth in the Central. Those Indians so far in front, they can't even find Milwaukee on the map anymore. But then again, who can? In the West, thanks to the Tigers, the Angels have a six-game margin on Texas and eight on Seattle. Over in the NL, Atlanta pulling away from the Phillies and Le Exposed. While in the NL Central, the Reds have only the Astros to worry about, and it's not much of a worry. Over in the West, unless the Dodgers start streaking, Colorado's going to win a division in their third year. <laughs> and the Giants want Deion Sanders to show up today. He may be fine if he doesn't get there. Of course, he was traded since to uh, San Francisco last week. If you're scoring at home, this is day 400 of the NBA lockout. Actually, I've just lost count because it matters so much. What are the Pistons doing during this lockout? Alan Houston has started his all-star basketball camp at the Joe Dumars Fieldhouse. 140 kids ages 7 to 17 for the five-day camp in Shelby Township. Some come from Austria. Alan must be big in Austria. But what about that lockout? Let's ask the uh, camp director. I'm optimistic about the season beginning on time. Uh, I think a few things have to be straightened out. And I think overall, I think everyone's on the same page in that they do want the season to start on time. Some of those kids are pretty good in those camps. You ever watch them? It's cool to watch them. It was a natural. Doug McClain, the new head coach of the Florida Panthers, the former Red Wings assistant, was hired by his old Wings boss, Brian Murray. It'll be Doug's first NHL head coaching gig, but McClain is a good choice for a team trying to break from the uh, Stalag mentality of Roger Nielsen. Hate to play for that guy. All right, still can't figure out what it was that Gary Stevens passed to Pat Day at the end of the Kentucky Derby last May. Showed it to you last night in the Sports Zone. Thunder Gulch Derby here. Appears to pass him something. It's his stablemate's jockey. Timber Country, of course, is part of the Lucas duo. What does he pass right there? If it's his wallet, we're okay. But if it's an electrical unit, like for an electrical charge, we got some problems, Houston. Keep checking. I want to know what it was that was passed over there. Guys, any thoughts? Because I'm telling you something. I'm not saying anything, but that's from May 6th, and no one said a word about anything wrong wow. with the Kentucky Derby. Hmm. Well, out, there sh should be some kind of an investigation, you would imagine. No one's there. returning calls. Hmm, I wonder what it was. Hmm. All right, Mark. Thank you. Silence is deafening. Yeah. Yep. All right, Mark. Mm. Thank you. Well, college is so expensive these days. You certainly need all the help you can get. Absolutely. Loans and scholarships are the traditional way. And now technology is making it easier than ever to find the financial help you and your kids need. That story is still ahead. And coming up at 5.55. It's one of the biggest selling movies of the year, but are retailers making any money off these Pocahontas toys? I'm Kathy Walsh. I'll have that story coming up. Zeller, Buzz Aldrin, Vinnie Johnson. Tough to say, though, there will be golfers and celebrities from across the country. Hal Linden, Hollis Stacy, Johnny Miller. All getting together to raise money for Henry Ford Health System's cancer program. Join us for one of the country's premier one-day charity golf events, Monday, July 31st at the Dearborn Country Club in TPC of Michigan. Get free gallery tickets at any Southeast Michigan Kmart store. Okay, but if you had to just watch one guy, one guy. Well, if you have children getting ready to go to college, you already know what a dent it's going to make in your budget. 
TV2 Money reporter Murray Feldman is here with one high-tech solution. And Rich says he's really interested in this. He has four kids ready for And you only have soon. 16 years to go. Not long at all. That's right. And I have two, and everybody's concerned about it. Uh, college costs are indeed climbing. 4.9% increase this year at University of Michigan for the new semester. But there are sources for your funding that you might not even know about. Today's Kipling Report takes a look at scholarship shopping by computer. This is the dream of so many parents, a college degree for their kids. It's what Pat Casebolt wants for her son, but it's been a tough year trying to realize that dream. There is no money that I have. And as a single parent, it takes my income to live. Pat's divorce put an end to any savings they had, so she's left with only two options. I went the long route in college, and I did not want that for my son unless it was a life alternative. The other option then, scholarships and grants to help pay the more than 10 grand Jonathan will need for each of the next four years to attend state college. You can go to your local bookstore, you can go to your local library, and they will have volumes there on scholarships that are available. You're almost guaranteed to find a short list of scholarships that your child will be eligible for. No matter what your field, no matter what your income, no matter what the child's grades are, there's probably something out there. Pat was ready to do the legwork, but the sources she found were less than encouraging. She and Jonathan reached out for help and found Cynthia Farrar at the National Scholarship Research Service. Cynthia ran their profile through her computer and came up with a match. 31, in fact, grants and scholarships they might qualify for. I had no idea. I just felt like somewhere there should be something. Now comes the hard part, filling out the applications for each and every scholarship fund. But at least, says Pat, she has hope. And be aware of this, uh, computerized scholarship search firms do charge a fee, so uh, you're going to want to know what the fee is going to cover and what it guarantees, if anything. And make sure that you check out that search firm very, very carefully. Check out the company before you pay any fee. Last week's stock market softness is over for the time being. The buyers were out in big numbers today. Dow Jones Industrials up more than 27 points. Heavy volume again today as more stocks moved up than down on the entire market at the New York Stock Exchange. Right now, let's take a look at closing prices of some of this area's most popular stocks. General Motors was down a quarter. Ford was down a quarter. Chrysler, though, up three-eighths. Kmart up to 16 and an eighth. That's about a uh, seven, eight, nine, ten month high there for Kmart as it moved up one quarter. Let's see some more stocks of interest to in Metro Detroit. Detroit Edison up one eighth. Dow Chemical unchanged on the day. Ameritech some profit taking there after a big rise last week. Ameritech down three eighths. Hope yours was a winner today. Michigan stocks doing pretty well so far. Yeah, Michigan stocks are doing very well. All right, Murray, thanks. Well, you've seen them uh, light up the big screen. They're your children's movie heroes. But can a popular film guarantee even more money outside the theater? You'll find out coming up next. And this evening on Bonds Tonight, a personal tribute to a former president from his rebel daughter. Patty Davis talks to Bill about her new book and her dad's battle with Alzheimer's disease. That's tonight at 11, right after Prime Time Sports. Stay with us. beginning to slow down, but then the movie was released and the toys have taken on a whole new life. Now products tied to TV shows or movies account for about half of all toy sales, taking some attention away from old favorites like baby dolls and bikes. In Southfield, Kathy Walsh, TV2 Eyewitness News. Now the uh, surprise of the season for toy manufacturers is the appeal of the movie Apollo 13. So the toy makers are trying to get some Apollo related toys on the shelves just in time for the Christmas season. Well, that's our program at 5. Thanks for being with us. But there's more news coming up. The fate of a young South Carolina woman rests in the hands of a jury tonight. Fuel will have that story. And, of course, the rest of the Eyewitness News report coming up right now at 6 o'clock. Well, Rich, the big question in Union, South Carolina tonight. Should Susan Smith live or die? Now, a jury is getting ready to answer that question. Next on the Eyewitness News report at 6, you'll get a live update from the courthouse in South Carolina. Jurors in the Simpson case get a chemistry lesson today. But is it going over their heads? We'll ask our expert. And a symbol of O.J. Simpson's past mysteriously disappears. We'll show you where it finally ended up. It's Monday, July 24th, 1995. Now, for national news with your perspective, the Eyewitness News Report with Hugh Perkins.